Okay, um, everyone, our next session is, um, we're going to start it. So our next session is on why CORE's approach to teaching uh, important, some e important economic concepts is different. And we have Antonio Cabrales from UCL and Margaret Stevens from Oxford University to um, talk to us. So we'll start with Antonio. Um, and yes, let's go to it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm going to start very much like, like the core does with a motivation. So I spent way too much time on Twitter, as you pr some of you <laughs> pro probably know. Uh, but I, I saw this tweet uh, a few days ago by Ben Golub, who is an economic theorist from Harvard. Many activists disappointed by the way our economy works blame a generic bugbear neoclassical economics. In contrast, left-leaning economists tend to think modern micro is the most powerful tool human, humans have for criticizing market out outcomes. And then he was saying uh, suggestions for, for uh, suggesting improvement to institutions at least two reasons for attention. The first is laziness. It's easier for your average Twitter rage voila to these neoliberals and mention Marx that, than to think literally about specific market failures and hard traders. And the, the second one, which I found the most interesting, is, but a second reason is economy's fault. Our intro and intermediate teaching typically undersells the capacity of economic theory to articulate forceful arguments against the prevailing order, even though this capacity is, for many practitioners, the whole point which was, in fact, the whole reason for starting, I think, uh, uh, what we're doing. And, and, and then he was in, in a discussion with Olivier Gosner, who is one of my co-authors, and I said, um, you guys have to check out core econ team. Games and institutions come before markets. The labor market is frictional from the beginning. People can be altruistic. My students learn King Solomon's dilemma before competitive markets. And I think that's the whole point of doing theory the core way is that we're doing it exactly like economists do it now. So we, we've seen it in, in, uh, in uh, Sam and Wendy's uh, lecture that this is really what we do and we're just reflecting what we do. Nothing more, nothing less. Okay, so don't just take my word. Uh, so it's not just me saying it. This is from a long letter we got this year from a, from a very good student. And this is, I mean, I, I'm highlighting one piece because I like it. So this woman said, I wanted to understand the world, understand the forces. Coming in the first year, the core econ program blew my mind. I don't think anywhere else does a first year student of economics learn about North House climate change model or the reason why immigration doesn't reduce native wages, all of which you need a little bit of theory to understand. You can't just say, this is the data. You need the theory to understand it. And she says, I felt so grateful for all this knowledge, which is a powerful tool, so grateful to have the, chan to, the chance to learn this. So I think. That's, that's the important thing. We, there was a need, we're catering to it, and the, you know, our customers are actually very happy that we're doing it. Um, okay, so the second thing we normally do, even in, if we are teaching economic theory, is to do an experiment. So let me teach, even though we're going to do more experiments later, this is one I don't always do, but this is one I like a lot because it, it shows something about the tension between, between theory and data, and I think it's very useful to do it to begin with. So here is the setup. There's a company that is worth between zero and 100 million under management of, of A. Uh, so this is some, some people that, let's say, own a track of, of, uh, of the sea someplace in the Gulf of Mexico. And there may or may not be oil there. Uh, and therefore, it's w worth anything between zero and 100 million. Now, uh, there's a different company B that is thinking of maybe buying out company A. This is a better company in the sense that it has better management tools, maybe better drilling, and, and so on and so forth. So that same company under management of B is worth 50% more. Mm? So it can go from whatever it is, just multiply by 1.5. Now, the tricky bit, of course, is that company A knows its actual value. They've been on the ground for a while. They've, they've been done the initial uh, pros prospecting and so on. So they know the actual value. And company B only knows the distribution, knows that it's worth between zero and 100 million, but doesn't know exactly how much. So, so that's a problem. Now, when I do this in class, I tell the students, this is your first assignment as a consultant for McKinsey. Uh, your future is going to depend on whether you get this right. So you have to advise company uh, A, and you have to advise them on a, on a bid. 
how much will you recommend to bid as a consultant for B? In the, your, your entire future career depends on getting this right. So you better you know, focus your minds and this, at least for UCL students, this focuses their minds enormously. So, um, so then, what's the answer? Okay? So th that's the data. A is better than B. Uh, uh, sorry, B is better than A. A is worth something between 0 and 100, but A knows, uh, and B does not know, and it's B that has to make a bid, and then A just has to say yes or no. How much would you bid? Okay, I'll leave you, like, 20 seconds because you, of course, all know the answer, so I'm not going to ruin it for you, but, you know, how much would you bid? Let's say, let's, let's take a poll. I'm not going to do something fancy here with, with uh, like Luca was doing, but, you know, a show of hands. Who would bid something, let's say, between uh, 150 and 200? No one. Between 100 and 150? No one. Between uh, 175? No one. Uh, all right. Between, uh, between 75 and 50? A few. Between 50 and, let's say, 25? Uh, between 25 and zero? Okay. So there's only one person that is hired here. Um, but don't feel disappointed. This is, in fact, very common. Uh, so this is an experiment that, that Samuelson and Basserman uh, did in 1985, and it's been repeated over time in many places. I have done it in audiences that are full of well-trained economists from, you know, from very different places in addition to with students. And the distribution actually doesn't look too different from this. So it doesn't actually matter very much whether you give incentives or not incentives. You know, very few people say more than 80. Well done. A few people say between 70 and 80, a few between 60 and 70, a few between 50 and 60, uh, and that's where the majority lies, and then very few uh, go below, uh, below 50. Although here it was a bit more, but that's because you're economist, not because you're cheap. Um, so, and here is the reality check. So, so you want to introduce this kind of tool if you want people to learn theory. Uh, so first, that's what people do, that's what you do, that's what the theory says. Should you do the same? And the answer in this case is no. Take any bid, any bid whatsoever, call it X. All right, so only firms valued below X will sell to you. If that's what happened, the expected value of those firms that are under A, under the A management, will of course be X over 2, but of course you're B, so it's worth more to you which means that the value of those firms under B is going to be 1.5 times x over 2, which is 0.75x. Now, you're paying, you're, you're getting, on average, a return of 0.75x for something for which you pay x. So your actual return on, on expectation is negative. Now, this is true for any x, so the best that you can do is, you know, bid zero. So if you bid above, above zero, you're fired, okay? And the, so... This approach, which is the approach of core, at least the one that I take, but you know, anyone can take a different approach, but the approach that I take about, about uh, teaching uh, theory with the core is confront students all the time with the data, come back to the theory, and then go back. So in this particular case, in fact, that's actually the right thing to do. So even though there's the, I, I, it's very hard for me to think of a reason why this wouldn't be the, the right recommendation. So, from the point of view of recommendation, you should be zero. But as a person that is actually potentially designing an auction, you should take this into account. And this allows you to, to, talk, to, them, uh, to, to talk to them about why there, there's in auction something called the winner's curse, what does the winner's curse represent, and why this is important. And, and also take into consideration what is the difference between what you should do as, as a company B when bidding or as a company A potentially selling and, and this tension between the theory taken in the more straightforward way without thinking about it and taking the theory one step beyond confronting with the data and coming back. That's literally what this, is, what this whole project is about. Okay, so how does this relate to the core? Of course, uh, as I said, the core takes evidence really very seriously. We are doing theory when we're teaching, like, let's say, 80% of the time, but the extra 20% of the time when we're doing evidence is really very important. But the other thing is evidence without theory is really not helpful. I mean, it, it's, it would be impossible to think. I mean, if it, I just give you the results over here, 
and just go home, you would, you would feel completely baffled. What am I learning from this? What's, what's the point? Uh, well, the, this is the point, and this allows you, this mental framework allows you to interpret how things are, are going, what are we doing, what we're doing. Um, it's also definitely true that students learn, learn more hands-on. If they have to do things, they're going to learn more than if they, they're just passively there sitting and, and listening to you and probably snoring uh, on the way. Um, another important point is that with respect to kind of more standard theory, behavioral biases do exist, and they are informative for how we do theory. We have to take them into account. If there's something we teach, behavior is not like that, we have to go back and keep going back and forth all the time. And uh, also, I think the final point and very crucial point, and that's, that's another very critical difference with respect to the standard way that, that uh, economics used to be taught, is that games and information are crucial for how we teach and learn in the core. If you remember this, this triangle, uh, where we went from here to here and then back here? So the standard teaching is up here in the triangle. You know, you're doing markets and maybe a little bit of decision theory, and they will go, have gone all the way back to, uh, to, to games, decision, interactive uh, situations. And that's very much what we do, and that's very much what we research on. So we are aligning better with, with the standard teaching. So, so that's why I, I, I wanted to use this, even though that's not strictly theory, it's this example to start with. Okay, now let me go a little bit more into, into what's the context. I give you the approach, what, why are we doing the way we are doing it. Okay, so for the first 10, 10 units, um, uh, which is the part that I know best because that's what I, what I, what I teach, this is sort of the, the, the framework, the structure in my mind for how we're doing what we're doing. So units one and two uh, are a little bit like something that, that, that it's, it's important. It's what the big question. What do we really want to answer? Uh, and also a, a little bit of a baby answer to begin with. We're going to develop this more, but, but units one, two, th unit one is, you know, it's a really impressive uh, trip that the, the humanity has done from 200 years ago until now. It's, you know, in all kinds of levels, it's, it's uh, kind of mind-boggling. There's nothing like that has happened in the history of humanity uh, uh, since the Neolithic Revolution. Uh, so we want to understand this, uh, and we provide the kind of tiny sliver of an answer having to do with technology. So technology is a, a big deal, but that's not enough. That's a, a bit too mechanistic, and we need to understand how, do, how did this kind of big technological revolution arose. Uh, and then we make the connection between the technology and the institutions. These technological revolutions, we say, wouldn't have arisen without changing institutions. They go hand in hand. They're, they're very, you know, it's impossible to disentangle them. Um, and in fact, you know, the history of economic thought is, is, is full of, of, of these stories. So it's in, in a sense, we're, we're a little bit of a, of a, of a Marxian uh, uh, textbook because we think you know, the two things go hand in hand. Is, is the, there is the institutions, there, there's the, how to say, the superstructure and the infrastructure it is. Uh, so it's, it's a two, the two things have to be tied together. Now once, we, once you set up this, this is the whole point of what we're doing over the next you know, 20 weeks. We can start with, with three units, which is what I call the core of the core. Uh, that's the, the methodological tools that you need to analyze all the rest that is coming. Mm -hmm. And it's divided into three little pieces. Uh, one piece is uh, limits of choice. So the, the, one if you, the one thing that economists are well known for is saying you know, people have to make hard choices, trade-offs. So if you talk to some very standard economists, they're always going to tell you that uh, economics is about trade-offs, hard choices, and so on and so forth, it's still there. We have the decision theory part, a person making a choice when there's a fixed uh, limit to their choice, it's already there. But then unit four tells you, but we have to go a bit further. So the trade-offs, the decisions that we're making are not always just a choice against nature, against a budget frontier, or something like this. You have to make decisions when the limits, in a sense, to your choice are other people. So that's, it's not enough to think, you know, hard trade-offs. It's hard trade-offs when the trade-off has, has a face, an eye, a smile, or a not smile. That's the, that's the other bit. And, you, and that's what, basically, games are about. It's a strategic decisions. It's decisions when there are decision-makers that are taking decisions, in a sense, against you. 
And, the, and here we can start introducing, once you take this into account, there are other things that are not normally taught that are very important. There's reciprocal altruism, there's social norms, there's a bunch of things that have come together, in, you know, inevitably wrapped in making decisions against other decision makers or, or, or in concert with other decision makers. And the fifth unit, which is, again, very novel and very important and also related to what we were starting and we have to make you know, connections all the way from, from the first to the, to the other units, is actually uh, the, 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 the games that we are in, engaging in are not fixed games. There are rules to the games. The payoffs that happen in our games, the strategies that we have in the games, they, they don't come from the sky. There's not just a, a god that kind of gives it to us. Uh, we design the game, we set up the rules of the game, and those rules for interaction matter a lot. And Unit 5 is all about how the rules of the game uh, determine where we are going. So in a sense, we can call this unit, they call this unit baby mechanism design or baby institutional design, and again, it goes back to here. In order to understand why do we have a technological revolution, institutions are important, and here you start seeing that if we span a whole range of different institutions, the outcomes are very different, and therefore we have to pay a lot of attention to how these institutions are designed. So that core of the core kind of set up how we work all over the place. Um, and then we start putting it at work, and unit six to 10 are kind of one example after the other of this. So first of all, we start with how uh, labor uh, relations happen within a firm, how the incentives are set up within a firm that determine the, the labor outcomes. And, and this is very important. So this unit six and this other unit nine on the labor market are really crucial and also very, very different from any, in anything else you see elsewhere. Uh, because we have, from the beginning, a uh, labor market that is frictional. Uh, there's going to be a labor market that inevitably leads to unemployment, and it makes the whole development of, of what, you know, in the old times one would call macroeconomics much easier. So you can go into new Keynesian economics without inventing, you know, out of the sky somehow a friction, or there's a menu cost, or, or some other strange friction. There is a very natural friction that has to do with incentives, that we've already started to develop in here that allow you to understand the labor market between uh, unit six and, and unit nine that produces a specific kind of labor market that, that will determine how the whole kind of general equilibrium of the economy uh, is determined. Uh, then unit seven and unit eight are about the firm. So whereas this is labor relations in a way, this is the firm. And we start de developing a firm in, 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 within the product market and how does the firm decide the price that it wants to set. And again, it is not a perfectly competitive firm. The firm has price setting power. It is limited, so in a sense it's limited and we use the same tools here that are used in here. So in fact, graphically are even the same tools. The same tools with which you learn the decisions, which in fact here are interesting uh, because many of them are uh, related to, to labor markets. So how do you decide on the number of hours that you work and the number of, of, uh, of uh, hours that you devote to leisure, which ties to this, also ties to the, how the firm makes the decisions, how the firm decides on the prices and, and, and the quantities that it's setting, given that there is a limit to the choices that it's making. And it's only in unit eight that you go to supply and demand. And, and it's like, uh, like Samuelson was saying, you know, many years ago, it's a special case. It's a special case that is useful for some reasons, but, but it's a special case that is sufficiently important that you want to study. But since we start already from the general case, we, we have uh, a reason for studying this particular case that may have some usefulness. And then it's only you know, in unit 10 that we start going into external effects and market failures. So, that, so that's the structure. And you can see it's really very different uh, from what, and it's, it is a paradigm change. I think it, it deserves the word a paradigm change because that's, that's what it is. It also, as we were saying before, it puzzles the students very much because they're used to a different structure and say, look, this doesn't look like A-levels, I'm worried, and what happens? And, but as I was saying earlier, uh, once they talk to the students in year two and three, it says actually don't worry, it's, you're going to do fine, and in fact in, in, in many ways they do much better. Precisely because years two, uh, in our case for sure, even in micro uh, and certainly in macro as well, they already take into account all this innovation. So this prepares them much better for year, for year two. 
Okay, so that's the content. Uh, let me show you a bit how this structure that I've told you uh, is how it, uh, it works. The structure tends to be repeated within units. So unit four, we motivated with a social dilemma. Okay, so the social dilemma that we motivate is climate change as a consequence of human action. So climate change as a consequence of human action has itself uh, very important consequences. Changing in sea levels, large population movements, cro food crop instability, water scarcity. And you have these graphs in here that say, okay, we know, we've known already you know, since, since the li late 20th century that we're going to get a big raise in temperatures and this comes from our action. Why are not we doing nothing about this? That seems a puzzle. And in fact, if an extraterrestrial form comes uh, after we disappear, they will think we are crazy. It's, you know, like in, in the Asterix uh, cartoons, when they say the, these Romans are, are crazy, well, you know, they will think you know, we are all, you know, stupid. How, how can you allow it to happen? So this is a puzzle. You have to motivate everything from, that's a data, the data seems, seems very strange, so you need a theory. Hmm? So we, we're not introducing the theory because we want to punish you. So the standard way we teach theory in, in, in economics seems like we want to either punish you because you're idiots, in the case that you're not in a university that is very selective, or if you're in a university that's very selective, we want to, to make you suffer because you're so smart that we need you to suffer, otherwise you're not going to. And, and I think that's the wrong way to motivate for many reasons. Uh, uh, not one of them that it's probably unconstitutional, but, but, but also because this, this is much better. We're not doing theory for the sake of doing theory. We're doing theory because we want to understand a complicated phenomenon, and if you don't have a theory, it's much more difficult to do it. So then once you've motivated, then you introduce the tools. So you start from the most babyish of tools, which in this case is a prisoner's dilemma, um, where individual decisions you know, suggest that you should do something, and, and you, you use this to explain what dominant strategies are, uh, and, and, but also you see why there is a problem. So what, what theory, kind of mindless theory would suggest that you do, uh, and what society needs to be done are two different things. And there's an initial theory, it's a baby theory, it makes a prediction, turns out to be from some perspectives, a rock prediction. It can explain some things, but it's, but yeah, in many places we've been able to overcome the naive prediction that you should uh, not cooperate and get a bad outcome when there is a better outcome for everyone that is, that is available. And we show them, uh, this is a very, very funny, gra very funny video from, from a, um, a, a TV program in the UK it was called, um, Golden balls. So check check out golden balls, and there's a, video, a nice video of golden balls that really literally playing this. Uh, in, in the, so so that's so that's what we were doing. So first, then 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 in, introduce them, telling them what well, actually this theory doesn't explain everything, uh, but it actually explains something. So even though the theory taken statically is not very good, if you go to the data again, you will see that you know, this is the graph from the worldwide uh, public good experiments and contributions over 10 periods. So even though at the beginning the theory doesn't explain much, over time it does explain, but the reason why this happens has a lot to do with reciprocal altruism. So this allows you to introduce another theory of reciprocal altruism that's very nice to explain in this context. Um, uh, and then once you've done it, you, so remember you go from evidence to theory against to evidence, against to theory in here, and then you see, and you know what? Uh, then rules of the game are, matter a lot. So and we explain them another experiment, and this is cooperation with and without punishment opportunities, and you see, look, this is the same kind of experiment, same kind of, of uh, 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 behavior as here, but we change the rules of the game and introduce the possibility in the second half that people punish one another, so the reciprocal altruism can do something about this, and okay, so reciprocal altruism is good and it, it takes us back. And it's a change in the rules of the game that allowed you to do this. So you are, again, allowing this to, to, to introduce, and this is within a unit already, we're introducing some of the themes. So interactions matter, rules of the game matter, evidence, so a, a, the same thing that is overall. Um, and so let me finish with something. This is something that I, that I, that I also do in unit five, not in unit four. Once you have this structure and you have all these tools, you can go beyond what's in the textbook. 
So, uh, so I, in particular, in Unit 5, I introduce a different game. It's not related to anything that you see in the text that allows you the, 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 the rules of the game matter. And this is King Solomon's Dilemma. It's a very interesting game that was used in the, in the motivation for, for, you know, the, for implementation theory and how this works. And it goes back to an old biblical story in which uh, King Solomon, who is supposed to be very wise, uh, and as the, you know, the, the Bible tells us, you know, this is the example the Bible gave us for why he is so wise. I will show that that's perhaps not the, a, a good definition, but uh, he's presented with the following situation. This is probably the first documented case of sudden death syndrome that we have in, in human story. Uh, two women that sleep together uh, and have their children, their babies with them. Uh, very, very sad, one of the babies die during the night. But because this is, this is a time in history where women are very badly treated in general and where, where babies actually have a usefulness because it, you know, their status depends on having children. Both uh, of the, of the uh, women said that the boy that survived is hers you know, because that would allow the, her to keep some independence in the, in the court and that was very important. Now, it turns out that actually Ruth is the true mother. We call her Ruth, although the, the book doesn't say anything. Uh, but, you know, but Esther is not. But Solomon doesn't know. And we need to say, so how do we solve this problem of allocating a child? There has two individuals that, that want it. Uh, now, what Solomon does know is that whoever is the true mother values the baby in 100. And this is where we show how colors their economies are. We're putting uh, a value on the, on the life of a child. Um, and Esther values it in 10 because it's not the mother, but it's worth something in terms of protecting her status in court. And of course, if you're not talking to non-economists, you have to make some jokes about the economists being evil because you know, we shouldn't put numbers in here. <laughs> so there's, you know, what you're confronted with this problem and you can tell you need to solve this problem and there are very different ways. So the rules of the game are going to matter a lot. So let's say, what could be rule one? That's a potential rule. And in fact, I'll tell you later what this matters. So rule one is high priest here flips a coin. If it ha comes up head, it goes to Ruth. If it comes up uh, tails, it goes to Esther. That's a rule. Now, it's, it's a rule. Now, if you, if you put this in the context of, of payoffs, that's a rule that is going to give you 100 zero with probability a half and zero 10 with probability a half. It doesn't sound very efficient. Uh, I mean, it, in some sense, it is Pareto efficient, but it, doesn't, it, it looks like it could be improvable, but you need to be cleverer. So this is one solution. It gives one outcome, and it has to be compared with other rules of the game and other outcomes. Rule two, and that's literally how Solomon explained this to the mothers. We'll see later that's not what he did, but that's what he explained. So King Solomon II say, okay, if you both insist that you are the mothers, the general here is going to split the boy in half and give half to each mother. Um, so that sounds very, very bad. Uh, if only one of you insists, then I'm going to give baby Daniel to the only woman who insists, because that seems to be a natural thing to do in that case. If no one insists, I'm going to give the boy to a third person. The book doesn't literally say this, but I have to make it up, because otherwise I cannot write a, a payoff matrix. <laughs> All right, so once you have these rules, you write a payoff matrix, and it's, you know, this is the payoff matrix. It's a two by two game. It's very easy to analyze. Because they have done the book before, I can tell the students, and what are the equilibria of this game? And they tell me, well, there's equilibrium one and there's equilibrium two. I mean, some of them are clever and have done further reading, and they will, well, and there's a mixed strategy equilibrium. Okay, so, so, but in general, they will at least be able to allocate. And then you tell them, so what does this say? Is this, is this man very wise? I mean, he's essentially almost replicating this outcome and it doesn't get anything extra, so how can he be claimed to be so wise? I say, aha! And the reason why he's declared wise is because he cheated. So that's another first from, from the Bible, the first example of a politician cheating on a, po on a policy promise. <laughs> so he said these were going to be the rules of the game, but when the mothers, and in fact what happened is that the true mother said, no, no, it's not mine, give it to her, and it was going to be this outcome. And then the wise king says, you know what? The only reason why you would have said this is because you are the true mother, and therefore I will give it to, to the other woman. And then, of course, in the book, you get the right solution, and of course, we are supposed to kind of clap and say that the, the king was very wise. But from the perspective of the game theory, this sounds very stupid, because if you try to do something like this, 
then you can do it once and that's it because you know the next time people are going to know and then so from the perspective of a gaming theorist is perhaps if you're anointed by God you can you can uh, kind of come up with this and and you know uh, you know be lucky enough that this that you're pardoned but but that's not you know, something you can replicate, so I need to give you a slightly better answer. Okay, and, and here is where, where uh, uh, the, other, the other two uh, solutions come up. So, King Solomon III, which is another thing, which would be the temptation of the standard game theorists, would say, what's the problem? There are two people who want a resource, they value it differently, what is an economist going to say? Well, you just auction the boy. If you auction the boy, it's going to go to whoever values the most, and, and that's the end of the story. And, and to, uh, to, be, to, to be even nicer, you could do a second price auction, first price auction, it doesn't matter because it's going to give you the same, the same valuation. Uh, on top of that, the king has some money. I can use it to, you know, to build you know, an extra piece of the temple and put a bit more ivory on, on, the, on, the, uh, and on the place and so on. So that sounds very nice, uh, and, and that seems like a solution. It is an efficient solution. The true mother gets the baby. But of course, you can say, well, but, you know, that seems also inefficient because I'm sure that this, this, uh, this king is going to squander the money as he would because he would just build a bigger temple, and that's probably not the most efficient. So suppose you want to be a bit more demanding. Then there's a fourth rule that is going to uh, be very interesting. So this fourth rule... Is, is going to say the same. Uh, so King, uh, uh, something different. So the King Solomon says, if only one of you insists to, to be given the child, I will give the, the, the baby to that woman. Uh, if no one insists, I give the boy to a third person. And the difference is here. If you both insist, each one we pay a talent. So each one would you pay you something. And then we conduct an auction to get the boy. That's literally what, what the solution says. So the only difference is, is that one gets to pay. Now, of course, uh, I haven't painted here the, the, the pay of matrix, but if you, if you reason through this, what are you going to say? So if both women realize that if both insist, they're going to each pay a, a, a talent, but at the end of the day, it's going to go to, uh, to Ruth, because she's the one who values the most. So you will get something here like, like uh, 99, and the other gets minus 1, and here you get minus 1 and 9. And, but the interesting thing is that game now has a unique equilibrium. Has a unique equilibrium in which the true mother insists, the other desists, because otherwise we go in here and we just waste, we waste resources, whereas here we don't waste any resources and you get literally a hundred and zero. Uh, so that's very interesting and, and this gets a lot of laughs from the students, but importantly then you challenge them. And where do you think this might be useful? Because, you know, it's not, it's not all fun and games here. There has to be some purpose to this from an economic point of view. And this is when you can say, well, in countries where, where, you, allocate, uh, where you allocate spectrum, for example, with a, with a, in, in a way that doesn't require the firms to pay in, a, in an auction, these firms end up investing more. And if you're a, a government that has enough, enough money, let's say you're Germany, uh, then you don't need any more money. You have all the money that you, that you want already, but you want mobile telephony to develop well, then you might want to use this mechanism because this, this allocates things without making the, the companies spend more money. And not, not always, but let's say 50% of the time there is someone that, that gets to something like this because they have enough experience. This is easier if you have some. I, I did this at the foreign office last week and there were a couple of people that got it. They, 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 they had heard about this, ah, I know, that's what's going to happen, and of course, this is a better thing here. Anyway, so conclusion, the core project allows to teach theory in a different way. Uh, it is, in fact, the way we do theory, and it's truly amazing. This was not done before, and so thanks for your patience. So this the marshmallow test is for your patience. Thank you. <laughs>
traditional topics, um, you know, take you back to the dark ages, if you like, um, uh, uh, and how we treat them and, and, and uh, uh, why we do them uh, uh, a bit differently. Um, so I start, I, I'm, I'll start by uh, reminding you what a typical uh, um, introductory text, uh, uh, how that begins. This is uh, the European uh, edition of, of Krugman and Wells. Um, and the first substantive chapter, chapter three, uh, on the first page, um, they introduce the supply and demand model, uh, a model of a competitive market. So what they say, um, and, and this is, is literally the beginning of the chapter, a competitive market is a market in which there are many buyers and sellers of the same good or service. More precisely, the key feature is that no individual's actions have a noticeable effect on the price at which the good is sold. Yeah, uh, pretty uh, uh, uncontroversial, I guess. Um, they seem to think that they need some, some kind of justification here, so let's just say that it's easier to model competitive markets uh, than other markets. Um, but they also say that when a market is competitive, its behavior is well described by the supply and demand model, and because many markets are competitive, it's a very useful model indeed. And uh, you can just imagine how the, how the chapter proceeds from there, and, and they do in, in introduce the supply and demand model in the way that we're all very familiar with and we're all um, happy teaching uh, to some extent anyway. We know how to do it. Um, so most introductory courses do begin um, with uh, uh, su market supply and demand curves with some kind of usually some sort of little toy example of a particular, particular market and they say that uh, you, you draw the lines and, and the point where the lines cross that's the equilibrium price and quantity. So we've kind of learned something. Um, they quite often rehearse the, the, the axioms of perfect competition. Um, they may acknowledge that most markets actually don't really satisfy those axioms. They don't look much like that. Um, but they do uh, implicitly or explicitly convey their message that the perfectly competitive model is a kind of good enough representation of the world um, for us to, to use it for economic analysis and that deviations from perfect competition are the exception, not the rule. And Sam referred earlier, I think, to the, to the, the deviations from the, uh, the nine deviations from the competitive labor market. Um, but nevertheless, we start with saying, here we've got the equilibrium in a competitive market. Um, they also, of course, carry a, a, a quite a heavy normative message very often, because we can demonstrate that competitive markets uh, allocate resources efficiently. So, uh, the kind of the implicit message uh, um, is that you know, markets work well, um, don't interfere with them, leave it to the market. And I guess we think that that is um, an easy model to teach. Um, probably the main, main reason we think it's easy is because we are so um, familiar with it. Um, but actually, if you start thinking about the demands that you're making on students in their very first introduction to economics, um, you're, you're actually ask, asking them to suspend disbelief uh, um, in quite a kind of radical way. Um, the, the very first step is to understand what it means, what an equilibrium means. So we have to say to them, first of all, everyone takes the market price as given. Then we work out what the market, market price is, and that's the one that they take. So, the, so, it, so it's straight away, it looks like a kind of a circular argument. It's quite a sophisticated thing to try to understand what uh, an equilibrium is in the, in the uh, economic sense. And we uh, hit them in the face with that right at the beginning. Um, the, when we start to think about uh, firm behavior, uh, what we have to do in this model um, is simply to tell them um, that the important decision that a firm makes is to choose quantities. Um, and again, that's, you know, it, it's quite hard to uh, uh, put that in a concept, context which uh, lines up with their sort of experience of uh, uh, what they observe <laughs> in the economic world around them. So the core approach, um, we don't leave it quite as late um, in, the, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in the text as Samuelson. It, doesn't, it, it, it comes considerably before page 400 and 47 or whatever it was, um, th but uh, um, we actually do quite a lot of work before we get to talking about uh, um, how markets work in any detail. And as Antonio described, um, units three to five, the core of the core, are really focusing on how people make decisions in economic contexts, 
um, and uh, um, also establishing uh, a, a method of analysis, essentially the method of, of uh, 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 one of the methods uh, established there is uh, constrained optimization that we're going to use, see in very many different contexts in economic models. So that's where we go first, um, and, and we're establishing the approach, but of course, at the same time, introducing lots of uh, uh, interesting economic questions that we can try to answer. And then we get to the firm, uh, uh, looking at the firm in some detail in Unit 6, um, and uh, uh, thinking about what firms are like, um, what real firms are like, starting with the data, um, and the kinds of decisions that they make. Um, and in Unit 6, that focuses particularly on um, the, the relationships between owners and managers and employees. And then in Unit 7, we get to perhaps uh, um, the kind of the, the first uh, uh, um, uh, example of the, the kind of the really traditional course, um, which is how do, uh, prof how do firms profit maximize and what happens when they do. So uh, we don't start with a competitive market. Um, we start with uh, price setting firms. Um, and again, if we, if we kind of look around at, at real examples of real firms, um, mostly um, if, if they are operating in a, a product market, um, they are probably thinking about what kind of price uh, to set. That's what we actually observe. And um, in, in theoretically, uh, the basis of this in, in Unit 7 um, is that they have price setting power because, pro because their product is differentiated from other products in the sense they work in their, in their own market for their unique product. And what's nice about starting here, I think, is that price setting is really easy to teach because it doesn't require that uh, kind of leap of the imagination to understand what an equilibrium is. Um, all, it, it, all, all it requires is to understand um, what the firm wants to achieve um, and what the constraints facing it are and to, to model that uh, um, as a, an optimization problem. Um, and so we introduce uh, profit maximizing firms and demand curves in a, in a fairly kind of intuitive uh, way, uh, just simply thinking of demand curves as the willingness to pay um, of the consumers in the market. Um, so that's the first step. Um, firms choose prices uh, to, to um, maximize their profits. And you know, conceptually, that's just a monopoly model. It's a firm facing a downward sloping demand uh, curve. But we're not thinking of this as monopoly in the sense we're, because we are thinking about real firms and we're uh, trying to think about the firms making decisions in an environment where they do face competition of, in different ways from others. So the market is there, um, but it's a kind of a, a, a partial equilibrium model, if you like. Um, and we can actually get quite a lot of uh, uh, um, mileage out of this and thinking about the way firms behave without going to any kind of uh, equilibrium at this point. Um, so the firm is setting the price in, in, its, uh, in its own market. Um, it's going to do that as a markup over marginal cost. Um, so we can already introduce the idea of deadweight loss at this point. Um, but there's competition, um, and the more competition the firm faces from more firms, from firms selling more similar products, that um, affects its price-setting power. Um, and at this point, we introduce elasticity of demand and look at how, um, as the, uh, the, the, how elasticity of the, the demand curve falls with competition, and that leads to firms uh, uh, setting um, a lower markup. Um, and this is, I think, um, it, we could call this, we could say that price setting with uh, differentiated markets is kind of cause benchmark, benchmark model, um, is model of firm behavior. And essentially that, in, in that way, in that sense, it reflects the benchmark in, in uh, uh, modern um, IO, which you know, focuses very much on differ differentiated product uh, um, oligopolies. Um, there is no formal treatment of, of oligopoly here, but as I say, you can uh, um, uh, uh, get quite a lot of mileage out of the kind of the partial equilibrium approach, thinking about the market and the firm's behavior within the market. 
um, we do go to, to equilibrium once we move to the, the kind of the macroeconomic model, and I think um, Wendy's going to talk about that tomorrow. Um, the monopolistic competition, which comes, uh, uh, which starts with this unit, unit seven, is then the, the basis for um, the core macro model. And we do go on now to uh, look at perfect competition, um, treating it as a kind of a, a limiting case, an interesting limit, limiting case, and a useful approximation, something that makes a good model for answering some kinds of questions. Um, so that comes in Unit 8, um, which is, is the kind of uh, uh, traditional sort of supply and demand unit, and this is just a kind of an overview of the unit. Um, the idea is that, that uh, the more competition that uh, uh, these price-setting firms face, uh, um, the more constrained they are in their uh, um, ability to, to vary prices and uh, the kind of limiting case is where they're price takers. And then we move in, in again, in quite a traditional way to um, supply and demand curves and the interaction um, between them. Um, at later in the course, um, there's, there's quite a lot of attention given to um, how uh, markets actually reach um, a competitive equilibrium, which uh, uh, um, is not usually something that, that, that uh, is um, stressed in, in, a, in an introductory course. Um, but we do the traditional things, comparative statics, supply and demand shocks, um, again, as far as possible, um, uh, uh, applying them to real examples to get some kind of insight. Uh, the first, uh, first uh, uh, example of, of uh, sort of real world example of supply and demand shocks is looking at what happened um, in the market for quinoa um, when it was first uh, 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 grown in South America um, and how that became a sort of worldwide market um, using the kind of supply and demand uh, uh, um, framework. Uh, we can do the standard analysis of gains from trade um, and look at the idealized conditions that you need to underpin this model um, and then discuss you know, to what extent, you know, what do we make of this model when, uh, when you look around, it's quite hard to find examples of, a, of, of perfectly competitive markets and show how, you know, for some, uh, uh, for some kinds of questions, this type of map of Dublin, if you like, um, does the job uh, and enables us to get insights into how markets work. Um, another kind of advantage of beginning with, with price setting rather than price taking is that we can then discuss the many other things that we observe when we look at firm behavior, um, that, that advertising, rent seeking and lobbying, incentives for innovation, which is a, a, a critical uh, uh, feature of core um, competition policy and so on. So that's kind of a, a quick sort of gallop through how um, core treats product markets. Um, this kind of second thing that, that I wanted to, to, to um, say something about um, is the actual method <coughs> that is used um, in Unit 7 and 8 um, for teaching profit maximization. Um, it's one thing kind of taking on a new course um, because it's got all sorts of exciting new topics in it. It's another if you're told that you've got to teach the topics that you thought you were very uh, uh, familiar with in a rather different way and that's in this particular case um, that is what we do we actually do use a rather unfamiliar approach um, to uh, profit maximization by firms um, using isoprofit curves now one reason for doing this is this gives us a kind of really a, a, a unified approach students by the time they get here they've already seen in difference curves and um, technological constraints or budget constraints. Um, so we can treat it as another constrained optimization and simply apply the things that students already know. Um, so we start in exactly the same way. Um, we say what firms uh, want to do, let's assume, um, is maximize profit. So let's draw some um, isoprofit curves. Um, and so the, the kind of the early bit of learning you have to do to, try, uh, to apply this method is to kind of get the idea about what isoprofit curves look like. So here is the first example. Um, this is based on uh, um, the uh, uh, Hausman study of apple cinnamon Cheerios. So we use the actual demand curve that he estimated. But here are the isoprofit curves, assuming that the firm um, has a constant unit cost of producing this cereal. Um, of $2 per pound. Um, 
And uh, so then we can kind of give you an intuition for the isoprophic curves if you want to produce 60, uh, if, you, if the, uh, uh, the, the, these are the ways of producing uh, $60,000 worth of profit, um, you could do it by a small quantity like 20,000 with a profit margin of three, or you could do it with a, a larger quantity, say 60,000, with a profit margin of only one and a price of three. And so we can draw uh, uh, isoprophic curves and then just present profit maximization um, as in the, in the kind of by now familiar way. We draw the demand curve um, and then say what prices and quantities are feasible. The firm would like to maximize profit. It would like to be on the highest possible isoprophic curve. But the only feasible quantities are the ones uh, with prices and qu only feasible outcomes are in this set below the demand curve. And then the, uh, uh, um, the optimum point uh, to choose is the tangency point here, um, which uh, represents um, a trade-off between price and quantity. So the second uh, 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 thing we need to get hold of in, in, in using this approach to teaching profit maximization is what that kind of uh, uh, trade-off means. Um, and I'll say a bit more about that in, a, in the context of, a, of another example. So this is a, a rather stylized, a kind of toy example of a, a specialized car producer um, where we've introduced a more complicated approach to costs and it has an upward sloping marginal cost curve. Um, and uh, uh, so then when we start to think about um, isoprophic curves, you can uh, b begin to realize that eventually as costs rise a lot, um, then uh, isoprophic curves are going to have to rise. Um, the pr you're going to need to raise the price as you in in increase quantity to uh, maintain the same level of profit. Um, the intuition you need to understand that kind of tangency point is what is the slope of the isoprophic curve. And the answer is, and it's fairly uh, uh, straightforward to, uh, to, to argue, to, to explain why, um, is that it's the ratio of the profit margin um, to the quantity. Um, and uh, uh, notice that the isoprophic curves always slope down when uh, the price is above the marginal cost and up when the price is below the marginal cost. Um, so you can argue why, think about the argument for why this is the case. If you increase your quantity by one, um, then you're, if you're in this region here, let's say, um, then you will, you're going to have to reduce the price um, because, uh, to, to make the same amount of profit um, because you'll get that extra profit margin on the marginal unit. And the amount that you need to re reduce the price is uh, this amount here to counteract, uh, because is, is this the price that on each unit has got to be uh, uh, reduced by that amount, um, because uh, if you think about the contribution to profit, that's going to offset uh, the gain that you made. So there's a little bit of work to be done here to understand how isoprofit curves work um, and to get some sort of intuition for them. Um, but once you've got that, um, then thinking about the tangency point um, becomes kind of straightforward. The optimum for the firm is to, um, to, to, to produce where the, and students have already by this point uh, uh, kind of encountered these ideas. It's a kind of marginal rate of substitution equals marginal rate of transformation uh, um, uh, uh, example where the isoprofit, the slope of the isoprofit curve is the um, the willingness of, uh, of the firm to substitute between price and quantity. Um, and then the uh, uh, slope of the demand curve gives you the, uh, um, the, the uh, trade-off that, that the firm is constrained to make between price, price and uh, quantity by, 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 by its demand curve. And uh, just a little bit, you know, an, another step um, gives you the optimality condition um, that the... Uh, uh, the profit margin as a, a proportion of the price, that's to say the markup, is equal to one over the elasticity of demand. And that is the, the kind of route into understanding how the market that the firm uh, uh, operates in um, determines uh, its, uh, its optimizing choice. And we've actually got all the other insights 
that you normally get from the uh, uh, profit map from the uh, monopoly model um, in the diagram here. The, the markup we can draw in the profit. In fact, you can, you can see what the difference in profit is because um, we can draw the zero profit curve and the uh, higher levels of profit. Um, we can talk about deadweight loss and so on. So it gives, so just this kind of simple optimization takes us straight to uh, uh, all the kind of insights that we want to get out um, of this kind of a uh, analytical approach to firms. So if you um, Google short-run profit maximization um, in Monopoly or says monopolistically competitive firms, um, you get hundreds of different diagrams and they all look a bit like this. Um, and just to compare the kind of the, the approach here, I think it's sort of startling the, what we expect students to, 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 to get hold of when they have to understand these diagrams. They have to, there's an awful lot of spade work underneath here, and they have to remember what each of these things is. The marginal cost curve, the, 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 the average total cost curve, um, the demand curve, the marginal revenue curve. Then we have to say, well, the profit maximizing point um, is this one here where marginal cost and marginal revenue are concerned. The diagram doesn't really tell you why, but it, it, it is. We know it is. And, and then that's the quantity, and then we've got to go somewhere else on the diagram to find out the price. So there's, you can see, I hope you, uh, and, and I hope I'm, I, I'm convincing you, that this is a very straightforward way to get all the same insights, or almost all of them, um, that you can get from this one. Um, there was a lot of demand from teachers for marginal revenue, <laughs> um, pe people who, for the people who first used um, core unit seven um, didn't take easily to, to this approach, I think it's fair to say. Um, so we did introduce a section where we did the more sort of traditional marginal cost equal marginal revenue um, approach. Um, but I think for me personally anyway, once I understand how to use this to teach, I think um, it, it is always going to be easier to remind students what they're doing, for them to remember what they're doing using this approach um, than it is using that one. The other thing that's nice about this um, is that we can go very smoothly to the perfectly competitive firm because it looks almost the same. Um, we just need the idea that a perfectly competitive firm has, cannot sell um, at a price higher than the price that other firms in the market um, are, are, are charging. And that means um, that the feasible set for the, perf uh, for the perfectly competitive firm is the area below the, uh, uh, where other firm, the price the other firms are charging on the diagram. Um, and that means um, that we have a tangency point uh, at where the isop isoprofit curves are horizontal. Um, and because we already know how isoprofit curves work, um, that they slope down when price is above marginal cost and upwards uh, beyond it. We also know that the marginal cost curve goes through the uh, minima, minimum points of the isoprofits. Um, and so we're straight away uh, understanding that um, the, the firm will choose a point, uh, an optimum, um, where price is equal to marginal cost. Um, and other than that, um, all the insights are just the same. Um, we can do the uh, standard um, welfare analysis, and uh, um, we have a. Um, uh, we can see that the markup um, immediately um, is is zero. That the price is equal to the marginal cost, and relate that to the elasticity. Um, and again, um, a, firm, a, a, a student using a sort of standard approach, another kind of randomly chosen diagram um, uh, from Google, um, here gives a sort of standard picture that students see with marginal cost and average cost. Of course, we've got the same sorts of things here, but in a very sort of, uh, uh, well, I think in a more kind of intuitive way, um, not least the fact that we say that, this, that, that the whole of this area is the uh, feasible set. So you don't have to make sort of strange arguments about how um, a firm that uh, charged a price below um, the, the, the market price would be flooded with demand or s something kind of similar to that. Um, it's just immediately clear that the best thing to do is to charge the market price. Um, so that's a bit of a, a, a rapid kind of gallop, gallop through, um, but uh, um, I, I think 
uh, I mean, there are some things in core um, that look unfamiliar, um, and I hope you'll find uh, when you've used them and thought about them, um, there actually are good ways for maybe thinking about doing some things a bit differently. Okay. <laughs>
when the, I think it's important to realize because it took me a while to, to, to do this in my own head. We are so used to every time that we have a, a, a picture like this, have the demand curve implicit in there, that it's, it's very hard for us. If, if you've never seen it, then, then, it's, then it's much easier because that P in there, it's not P of Q, it's just P. Yeah. And in fact, in my first set of slides, I had written P of Q minus, <laughs> and then I said, oh, no. <laughs> And uh, so it's, it's, just, it's just any P, any PQ combination you care to think about, and that makes it much easier. Yeah. Another thing that's nice about, um, I mean, especially focusing on the constant cost case, um, then you can do an increase in costs so incredibly easily because it just literally is a translation, a vertical translation of all the, because everything is measured relative to the, uh, the, the, the constant cost. Mm -hmm. So you can easily do the kind of comparative statics exercise of what happens if costs increase. Okay, let's go. We have two more questions. We'll take two together and then I think we might have to wrap up. Yeah. Yeah, we'll leave the rest of the questions for people. Okay, uh, I have actually kind of one suggestion, one remark, so not really questions. As there is lots of white space on this figure, would it be possible or helpful, at least, I mean, I do this, uh, to kind of put the algebraic derivations next to it or probably have some kind of on-demand feature to switch it on and off because this kind of helps me to kind of see where this stuff comes from. Mm -hmm. And the, this was the first, and the remark was, uh, I mean, if you want to go to a graduate level text, uh, which kind of takes a pretty similar approach uh, on going from decision theory to kind of building up on this. I think uh, the foundations of non-cooperative game theory by, by Ritzberger, which is not a very well-known text, but it's, it takes pretty much this structure, but at a very technical level. So I, 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 I just kind of saw this, and this was, I mean, because this book was such an eye-opener for me of kind of how to think about economics and economic decision-making, I thought I just wanted to share for people who want yeah. to kind of have a look okay. at that. Thank you. Okay. And maybe let's just let me add on this that, that Jeff Ely has a set of lecture notes in, in his web page for an intermediate text that follows, in a sense, the same structure of kind of game theory, decisions, games, and, and, and uh, institution building. Much more technical, so if you're interested in something like this. Well, I have more questions. It's not even a question. It's just a comment on um, what you were saying. I struggled hugely with teaching ISA profits for the first time this year. Um, my shortcut was I've built a simulation in Excel so you can just mess around with the functions. As a teacher, I found that very useful for just saying, okay, if this is what I'm thinking of, where is it heading? I'm happy to share it if anyone's interested. Yeah, please upload mm. it to Colab. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. If we could have a last round of applause for our <laughs> speakers. And we're back in? 15. In 15 minutes. We're back in 15 minutes.